Uh, Lord, thank you so much for this study and this time, your word, Lord, above all else. And thank you that you are able to, to minister to our hearts, Lord, no matter uh, how distracted we were today and how many things have happened, how many uh, whatever has come our way, um, that we could just stop and focus in on you, Lord. We pray that you would protect our thoughts, protect our hearts, Lord, uh, not to be hardened uh, as we grow in the knowledge of your word, but rather... Uh, to absorb, Lord, and to desire and to delight, Lord, in all of your word. And so thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity uh, just to, to read and, and to uh, know that our faith, Lord, is just increasing as we hear your word uh, just being taught to us. And so we love you and we thank you and we pray uh, that you would just continue to do a mighty work within our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Genesis 28. So we saw how Isaac and Rebecca, you guys remember last time we were talking about how they were basically trying to either, uh, I don't know, thwart God's plans, right, or, or, or to be like, God, I know you said this, you know, you're going to, you know, Jacob is going to be, you know, Esau is going to serve Jacob and he's going to be first, but, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to help Esau out here, you know, we saw their plans and how their plans didn't really necessarily come true. But God's plans always come true no matter what we try to do, right, in and of our own selves and our flesh. So, um, obviously, we can't change God's plans. We can't um, do anything, right? God doesn't even need us. We, he doesn't even need our help, right? We can't help. Lord, let me help you. I know you want to do this, so I know I'm the guy to do it. So, here we go. We're going to do what I got to do. So, uh as it turns out, uh, Esau actually ends up hating Jacob so much so that he wants to kill him, right? And this is part of the, the works of the flesh, which always ends in death. And so it's very interesting. Rebecca wanted to send Jacob off to uh, Laban's place. You guys remember that? And that's actually where uh, Isaac met, or I'm sorry, that's where... Where Rebecca was from, so she wants to send she wants to send him over there to get a wife. And this is about 500 miles uh, from uh, in Haran, right? So to go get a wife, and then oh, of course come back, you know, a few days later after your 500 mile journey. You know, like, I'm looking at this all. What? How is he getting there? So we'll we'll just pick up. You guys, you guys know all the other stuff from last time, but so from chapter 28. <clears throat> All the way to chapter 36, actually, uh, we're going to start to see Jacob's life a lot more closely. It's just going to get a little magnifying glass, right? And, and it starts to look into... Remember, it's Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And then we're going to see Joseph, lastly, right, at the end of Genesis. So we're going to see basically five things right here in this chapter alone about the life of Jacob, right? It really just shows a lot of his life and his, you know, who he is. So the first is really the charge for Jacob. Look at verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And, and while he goes on, that, that's what Rebecca wanted him to do, by the way, at the end of um, chapter 27, right? So he's kind of confirming already of what she already wanted, told him to do. Padam Aram is really the city of Haran. So if you guys are looking up, like, where's Haran? You know, or, or Haram, whatever way you pronounce it. This is another, basically the same place. It's 500 north, 500 miles north of where they are. Um, it's between the Tigris and the Euphrates, so modern-day Syria and then, like, uh, Le Lebanon area. Uh, actually, the border area of today. So, <clears throat> it's the same place where Abraham, right, told his servant to go, and the servant found Rebekah, so that's the area. So, the thought here is that Jacob was to get a wife, basically from his own people. Don't stay here, and don't get a wife with the Canaanites. Right? That's what's going on. But really, we know from last chapter that Rebecca's just trying to get him out of there. It wasn't even about the wife, right? It was about, you're going to die, <laughs> and I'm going to protect you. It was nothing about, let, let, let God go and protect you. Was, this was all a scheme from Rebecca and Jacob the schemer, right? The deceiver. He's, he's, he's all in. He's all about it, and he's going with her plan. And so, 
Um, and obviously the pagans, they, they, well, the Canaanites, right? They were the pagans. They intermarried with the other pagans, right? And they, and, and so there's just, it was, they didn't want any of that stuff. So they didn't worship God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was their worship of whatever else. So <clears throat> therefore Jacob was to stay away from them, right? And have nothing to do with them. So I was looking at this and I was thinking, man, that's the same thing for us today. We, you know, just look at this practically. We, we need to stay away from the world in every sense, right? Not just marriage. We already know that. Most of we're all married. Some of us. <laughs> but the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 14, <clears throat> Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? So we have nothing in common with them. Nothing. As believers in Christ, we're to stay far from them, right, as believers. So we, we know, when it comes to, like, the dating scene, right, the missionary dating, it's not a good thing, right? We don't have to get into all that. But we need to be careful because, obviously, bad company corrupts good morals, right? And it's never the opposite. It's just always the bad company is always going to corrupt the good, right? We can't really corrupt... They're already corrupted, right? Does this make sense? So you and I need to be set apart for the Lord. And that's what it, it basically is talking about, right? Be holy, be consecrated, be set apart onto the Lord. And that's kind of what's going on with Jacob finding uh, someone else besides a Canaanite, right? So 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So not only for our lives personally, but for basically our lives generally as well. <clears throat> I think don't, don't go into business, and this is me personally, what I'm going through. I'm just looking at you know, what the Bible says. We shouldn't go into business with the world as well, right? Don't, don't be partners with them. Because your biblical morality is not going to be their same morality. Their, their morality is the worldly morality, right? They're like, it's okay to, you know, leave this out on our taxes or leave this in. Or, you know, they're, they, they're okay with certain things because they have no standard. We have a standard, and that is perfection. That's holiness, right? It's onto the Lord. They don't, they can care less. It's not onto the Lord. So we got to be very, very careful um, in not choosing the world, just like Jacob, right, is being advised wisely not to take this wife, right? So the same is true for the church corporately, by the way. Um, we need to be <clears throat> very careful to teach what the Bible says, right? Teach what the Bible is teaching and not what we think, not what we feel, even, even if the law says otherwise. And it will and it is, right? It's already saying, oh, you can't do it, you're going to hurt my feelings, I'm going to lock you up, right? <laughs> they get all crazy. But there's a lot of churches that are even being used by the government, but they're, they're, getting, they're gaining profit from the government, right, on certain things in certain ways. And we got to be careful in the Word to just stand on what the Word says, even though it means not gaining what others are gaining, right? Not to look at others and say, hey, they got all this, why don't we get all this, Right? We gotta be careful to say, hey, let's just let's just let the Lord do what He's gotta do, right? Who are we? And who are we to help God? <laughs> so that's the that's the thing. Anyways, let's come to the second thing here. The, the blessings onto Jacob. Look at verse three. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples, and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So it would seem here to me, and I don't know about you guys, I'll let you guys just say whatever you got here, but to me it seems like Isaac totally had a change of mind, a change of heart from where all of his actions have been speaking loudly, right? All of a sudden there's a change here, and you realize that God had a purpose and a plan for Jacob in his life, since this blessing is obviously it's genuine, right, that he's given to Jacob, 
In fact, it parallels to Abraham's in chapter 12, if you guys remember. But it's interesting, this is what caught my eye most of all, where he says in the very beginning right here, God Almighty, the El Shaddai, right? And, and that's, I believe Isaac came to that place in his life where he realized God's doing a work here. I need to back off, I need to just, you know, align my will with God's will and, and just let the Lord, you know, have his way because his promises are coming about. In fact, why? Because the Lord God Almighty, right? Notice this, God all-powerful, right? He realizes God's, God's in control, right? I'm not in control, even though I tried to give it to Esau, but it's all going to Jacob already, and he's already got the, I'm just going to go with the flow here. It's almost like a, I don't know, if, do you guys see the same thing here? It's kind of a, you know, all of a sudden you're reading this, whoa, what happened? <laughs> you know, did, did a couple years pass by, or, you know? But, but question in our own hearts, too, do, do we realize that God is the God Almighty? That He really is God Almighty? I think if, if this was the case for Isaac right here, man, everything just changed at that moment. And I think for us, everything should change the moment we realize God is almighty, that he is all-powerful, that he is all, he's large and in charge, right? He's, he's in control of all things, and we are nothing compared to his power. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. 2 Peter 1.3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So notice this power, basically everything that we need in him that he requires of us is his sufficiency basically through us. He's given us all things that we need that are required of us to fulfill what he's already asked of us, but he wants to do it in and through our lives. He wants to give us everything that we need. He's, he's not saying, here, go and do this mission, and you're all by yourself. you gotta, you got to you know, provide for yourself. No, he's saying, I'm going to provide everything you need. Everything that is according to my will will be yes in every prayer of yours, because your will will be my will. It, it, it just works. It's just it's together. So when you truly believe that God is in control, that He is all-powerful, that He is the El Shaddai of your life, what's going to happen? All of a sudden, you're going to have this peace in your life, right? You're going to have this rest where you're like, I don't care what came my way, what the enemy like is trying to shoot at me, right? It, it hits us. If we're in our flesh, then we just fall apart. We're like, ah! but But once we realize, hey, God's in control, I don't, I don't care. But we don't have the money. Who cares? Right? Oh, but you don't have any house, you don't have transportation, you don't have a job, you don't have this, you don't have... Right? God's in control. He's the one who made us. This isn't my life to make the decisions in my life, right? It's His. So, is He truly the Almighty, the God of our lives? Ephesians 1.11 In Him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works in all... He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Notice, it's His working in us from start to finish, right? It's the Lord from A to Z. It's, it's all Him anyway. So who are we to even think about where the direction of our life is going to be? Lord, what am I going to be in five years from now? What am I going to do in ten years from now? What am I gonna, who cares? Let it be the will of God in your life five, ten years from now, right? That's all that matters. Are you abiding in Him? Are you allowing Him that Lordship over your life, that... He is all-powerful, that He is the El Shaddai, right? So I think that, that's kind of what caught my eye. And I think if Isaac, if he was at that turning point right here, obviously he's going to give God, you know, there's, there's different words that we say in our prayers in our lives. When we're changed, and, you know, things that happen, we refer to the Lord. We have more of a reverence before God, don't we? When things change in our lives, it's just more of a respect, more of a, I don't know, for me personally... And, and I think if that's the case here, that's, that's pretty awesome. So, um, I don't know, did you guys catch anything here? Oh. So let's come to the third thing. Here's the obedience of Jacob. And 
Look at verse 5. Actually, does somebody want to read verse 5 through verse 9? <coughs> the obedience of Jacob. Verse 5. As I, and Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram, unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram, to take him a wife from thence, that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took him to the wives which he had, Mahal Mahalath, and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Hebajah, to be his wife. So, at this point, Esau has how many wives? Pop quiz. One. He has three wives at this point. So two Canaanite wives he had, and then he goes and gets a, a wife from basically Ishmael, and he's thinking he's doing an awesome thing here. But Esau is brought into the scene here all of a sudden, right? And because he saw that Jacob pleased his father by being obedient to his father in not taking basically a wife from the Canaanites, right? So, and Esau wanted to please his father as well. Have you guys noticed that with twins, by the way? They're always kind of, you know, who's going to be the best? Yeah, competition. Who's going to, you know, get there? And so I kind of see the same thing here happening. All of a sudden, he wants to please his father. But notice, he's going to try to please him by the flesh. He chooses uh, a wife from Ishmael instead of from Isaac. Right? If, instead of going that line, or, or not going from the Canaanites. And we obviously know, you know, Ishmael is really a picture of the flesh, you know, of all the things that are happening there. So, it, it blesses him, um, <coughs> Isaac, that Jacob chose not to get a wife from the Canaanites, right? And it, it's the same thing with the Lord. When we choose to obey the Lord, obviously by the grace of God, right? We can't obey him from our flesh. But when we choose to obey the Lord, it blesses the Lord. Imagine the Lord, like the Bible says that the Lord, He rejoices over us, right? He dances over He sings over us. Like, get the image in your head. It's just like, that's amazing. It, how would I be in this, you know, in His mindset? That's, it, I, you know, it's hard to understand that. But it's because of His Spirit in us. So, we may desire to please Him. Right? But we're going to fail continuously. We're always going to fall short of His glory and fall flat on our face, right? Uh, constantly. I, I constantly fall short. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like Paul, you know, at, at the end of, uh, he goes Romans 7, right? He, he says, you know, what I will to do, I don't do. You know, what I, what I know I, I should be doing, I don't do. And what I know I, I shouldn't be doing, I do those things. Like, oh, man. You know, I, and then he goes on and, and he's talking about, like, uh, uh, man, I should have just looked it up. But, but like, you know, what was him, basically, right? Like, who, who's going to deliver me from this, this body? It's Jesus, he, he ends up saying, right? It's only Jesus. He's the only one who can deliver us. And, and only Jesus within us can please the Father who has required, basically, you know, everything of us, which is perfection. So when Jesus is in us... He's empowering us, enabling us to perform His will to accomplish whatever He wants us to accomplish. Romans 1.5 says, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name. So Esau tried pleasing his father through his flesh, right? Jacob pleased his father in a picture of, I guess you can say, of the Spirit. Um, so, it, pretty interesting, right? You can kind of see the flesh and the spirit here. One is obedience, the other is kind of the work of his own, it's his, his own doings. So, we're weak, we're powerless in and of ourselves, right? In our flesh. We can't perform anything good for the Lord. And we cry out to the Lord and we say, Lord, I can't, right? I need your help, Lord. And then finally, God's all, oh, well, there you are. <laughs> I couldn't hear you before, right? You know, now I can hear you because that's humility, right? God gives grace to the humble. And now that you've given yourself up, now He can fill you up, right? Because He can't fill up one that's already filled up, 
He can only fill up someone who's emptied of themselves. And so once you die to yourself and you say, okay, Lord, I quit, right? <laughs> Whatever you want to do, I'm going to walk by faith. Um, then he steps in, right? And he shows us and gives us and, and we receive all the goodness of the Lord, whether, it, I don't know what it is, right, in our lives. Everything that we need, he fills in, in our lives. And it makes sense, Philippians 4.13, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, but it's him, right? Ephesians 6.10 uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of your might, because you're mighty and you're wonderful. Amen? Amen. A woman? Hey, anybody? <laughs> no, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. All right? Not our own. So, um, you guys catch anything there in verses 5 through 9? I kind of saw that obedience that Jacob had, and that's kind of the what, only thing that caught my eye. Well, it kind of makes me think of like the Cain and Abel being like they're sacrificing, you know, to the Lord. It was kind of like a matter of their heart mm -hmm. in the matter, you know. Yep. The two brother thing, you know. That's right. One was good and one was not so good. <laughs> what stuck out to me is that, um, you know, Jacob did what his, Jacob pleased his father because he did what his father said. And when Esau went out to, you know, when he set out to please his father, he didn't bother to go to his father and say, what would please you, you know? Like, and that's what we're to do when we want to please God. We go to his word, Lord, what do you want me to do? We don't just go and make up the rules and say, oh, I bet God, this will make God happy. You know, but that's what Esau did. He went out, he, you know, he did his own thing, his own way, you know, hoping that the byproduct of it would be that he would please his dad. But he recognized, I mean, he even, he even saw it. He said, um, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away, and, you know, just a dot, 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 and that <laughs> Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to him, and Esau, seeing that the daughter of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, like, he recognized his father was pleased because Jacob obeyed him, but he didn't bother to go to his father himself. Right. Yeah, the Bible says that we're to walk by faith, and not by sight, and obviously he's looking by sight, mm -hmm. trying to please his father, right, and trying to walk that walk, you know, being obedient. That's awesome. And obviously the flesh is always going to reap, never the spirit, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's always going to be the work of the flesh, and that's always going to lead to death. I like that. The verse that you had referenced that um, Paul speaking about doing the good. Um, that was Romans 7, 19. 19, okay. Yeah. yeah, there it is. I knew it was somewhere in there. Got Romans 7 right, though. <laughs> there you go. So, let's look at the promises to Jacob. The promises to Jacob, and this is going to be in verse uh, 10 through 17. It says, now, to, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it out of his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Notice, by the way, um, Jacob had traveled about 70 miles, right, from Beersheba going north to a city called uh, Luz, Luz, right, Luz. Um, and so... Later, it would be called Bethel, and we'll see that right now in this chapter, which is the house of God, which is actually five miles north of Jerusalem. Very interesting. So if you guys ever go to Israel and go to Jerusalem, be like, hey, can we go north about five miles this way? <laughs> I, just, I just want to look at the rocks. <laughs> I want to take a nap. But anyways, in verse, uh, let's look at verse 12. It says, uh, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and it's Top, its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Notice we refer to this as Jacob's ladder, right? And and so so here he's he's in Luz, right, the little north of Jerusalem, and he uses a rock for a pillow because he just traveled about seventy miles, and that's that's a long traveling. I travel like I don't know how many miles per day, right? About it's about 100 miles, right, a day. Um, and I'm, I'm exhausted, right? A rock looks comfortable to you at that point. You're just like, anything, I don't care. And that's and, what it's called. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's my seat cushion. But, so, he falls asleep, though. He has this dream. 
and, and then he sees this huge ladder, which at the bottom, it's, it's being held up from basically the earth, and then it's reaching all the way to the top to heaven, which is kind of interesting if you ever wondered where heaven is. It's not in the core of the earth. It's not like south of the earth. Whenever it's mentioned, it's always north, right? It's always up, and it's always above the earth. Interesting, just side note. But there, there's this huge ladder, and, and so it's shooting up to heaven. But what's happening is there's angels ascending and descending. And what's going on here, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Maybe maybe it's like leg exercise day. I don't know what's happening. So, but musical what, chairs. Yeah, musical <laughs> chairs. <laughs> there you go. So, so I don't know what the, the deal is with the whole ladder, but it speaks of God's connection to earth, right? So as far as his intervention in the life of man. So the, the picture is these angels are getting their marching orders from God, and, and they're going down, and they're basically, they're coming down the ladder to go fulfill the plan that God has for man. So whatever it is, and then they're, I don't know, they're reporting back to God, right? Going back up for the next order. I don't know what's going on. So these angels, I do know, are accomplishing God's plan. I do know that for a fact. It, 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 actually, in two ways. Number one, they're ministering angels, right? They're, they're, they're here to minister to us. Uh, Hebrews 1.14 says, Are they not all ministering spirit, spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So... I'm not sure how exactly they minister to us. <laughs> I don't know the whole, you know, everything about that. But I do know they minister to us. That's all I do know. Um, in fact, the second thing is they encamp around us. Right? The Bible is very clear. And, uh, David talks about it in Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So they camp out around us protecting us, guarding us, if you will, and, and delivering us from basically whatever comes at us, right? Or, you know, to us, our way. So I think it's, it, it's a question of how, how these angels um, do their job, right? But I don't think, I don't know, well, here, here's the thing. They're, they're doing whatever they got to do, whether they make a mistake or not. Some people are like, oh... All these bad things have happened in my life, so I don't think these angels are, you know, I don't think that's, I don't think that's the focus. The focus is God's plan is being accomplished, right? So whether you have more trials or less trials, it's not about angels, right? We're not to light a candle to the angels, right? I know Family Life Radio was like, all oh, last December, they were like, oh, we're going to light a candle to so-and-so angel, and I was all, oh... Who are these people? Yeah. Are they really? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Huh? Um, so people do some awkward stuff for angels. They pray to him. They, 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 I don't know. Name them. They name them. Yeah. They do some wacky stuff to them. They make little images. This is angel. Ooh. <laughs> right? But we're not to do those things, right? Don't get the focus on the angels and the work of the angels. Get the focus on the work of the Lord because they're just ministering spirits, right? We minister to one another as well. And, and that's a great thing. But uh, I don't want to get too caught up in the angels. But um, Are you about to leave that passage? What? No. No, go ahead. Are you sure? Um, well, I was just going to say, like, if people think, you know, that you know, the angels are lacking in some way, and there's a lot of stuff going on. Look at Job's life, right? Like, Job went through a whole lot of stuff, and it wasn't anything to do with angels. It was, to, you know, it was all because of God allowed him to go through those things for his will to be done, for his plan to be done in his life, right? And really in God's eyes. So, and then the problem is, basically, our plans don't line up with God's plans, and that's the problem, Right? We want God to line up with our plans, right? We're like, Lord, you have this time, you have this color, you have this, right? You've got to, like, make it all direct. But God's plans are not our plans. The Bible says, Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your hearing shall spring forth speedily, your righteousness shall go before you, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking, well, it goes on from there, but, um, 
So interesting stuff here. What, what were you going to say? I, I could keep going. <laughs> I was just going to mention this. Jesus, of course, gives reference to it in John. John chapter 1. About what? Uh, when speaking to Nathaniel, Jesus, when he speaks to Nathaniel, uh -huh. he says, uh, he goes up to him, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. This is chapter 1, verse 47 of John. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The interesting thing to take note of is that both in the Hebrew and the Greek, angels just means messengers. So it doesn't right. always necessarily mean, you know what I mean? And it's almost like you're seeing an example earlier where he's looking into something that has a future fulfillment. Yeah. You know, obviously during Jesus' ministry, kind of the same like Abraham when he talked about the covenant, not to say that wasn't a covenant for them, but yet it pointed to the future covenant. Mm. You know? Yeah. So. Yep. That's pretty neat. It, it's amazing to just realize, like, we read this all the time, but just realize, man, there's, that's reality. Like, there's angels. <coughs> there's these other creatures that are intelligent just like us. Right? The angels are like, just like us? <laughs> and they're all, we're a little more than you guys, but I don't know. What, you know, but there there is other creatures out there. So when you're watching TV and they're all UFOs, could there be others out there? I don't know. Right? Yes, there is. There is other ones out there. Are they in our, you know, our I don't know. How to say it? Yes, I don't know, but our yes. <laughs> but I do know that they're there, and the Bible makes it very clear, just as clear as your salvation in Christ. Is, is very clear in the same text, basically, in the Bible, talks about these creatures. So there's no denying that there's these angels, right? And they're, they have their roles and their, you know, their missions, if you will. And they're out there, and, and, and it's crazy to think that we actually encourage them. And we, we can minister to them. And one day we're going to be a judge over them, which is crazier to think. But we... Uh, there's, a, there's so much going on. So it's, it's crazy. When you're, when you're going about your regular day, consider you're not the only one around, right? There's, there's a spiritual battle going on for you. The enemy knows that you're already going to have it made when you die, so they're not going to try to kill you right away. They're going to try to torture you as much as they can because you retire once you die, right? It's like, man, life is good now. <laughs> but so crazy stuff going on. Um. I was looking into uh, 12 to try and understand why why we even get a glimpse of what's going on there, but not really any explanation. And I think you kind of touched a little bit, but the word ascending and descending there is to be sent and to come to. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> this is purely speculation. But it kind of looks like, like the authority that God has and how they are, how angels are ministers. Because it, it, if the word ascend means to... Uh, like kind of to report to, and then descend means to mm. to be sent. That they are actually going through. Like I mean, we see a ladder, and again, this is speculation. I'm not trying to say this is true, but you see the steps that God's giving them, and they're reporting, and then going and, and going back. And so it's actually the operations of the angels that God's giving them, going to and fro. Yeah. And Jacob actually gets to see that. That's it. That God's orchestrating you know, his his power. And Way he's using angels. That's awesome. It's kind of, you know. It's like a, I think of the military, right? Like the whole military setup right there. Yeah. And I think of like to, yeah. uh, Elijah the prophet. You remember there, the angels are all encamped around the other army, oh, yeah. and they're just gonna knock them out. But like, the, who's, you know? It's amazing how there's power in interce intercession, prayer, right? When we intercede on behalf of others, obviously. But there's, it's amazing how God intercepts that. He listens and he, he commands these guys, right? These angels to go and 
do all this stuff, whatever it is. Remember in Sodom and Gomorrah, why did that all come about? Because he heard the cries of his people, right? Israel, Egypt, he heard the cries of his people. He went and he acted on it. That they're crying out to the Lord, they feared the Lord, and, and God, there's just something about, you know, prayer that happens before these big events where the angels come in and um, I don't think they came in right there. We see in with Egypt, but um, interesting stuff. Look at verse 13. It says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the the." the Lost my place. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And notice, uh, it also says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I love that. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I did not know it. Wow, there's another good verse. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. Thus, why we call it Bethel. And this is the gate of heaven. So God here basically is reiterating to him what he did what he did say to Abraham and Isaac. Now he's saying it to Jacob, the same thing basically, right? And but notice this is what caught my eye here. So if you guys are just reading this through, you're you're seeing everything at you know all together. Um, but if you're coming week by week and you're just getting the story by then, you're gonna forget this stuff. But realize this at this point, Jacob has never actually heard or seen from the Lord, right? Abraham did. He heard from the Lord. Isaac heard from the Lord. Jacob heard about God, but he didn't personally hear from the Lord. And at this point, he's finally hearing from the Lord himself. And, and that's so neat, you know, when we think about it. Before we met Christ, it was the same way. We heard about God. And then when we finally give our lives to the Lord, he literally changed us. And we just, you know, for me personally, it caught me like, Kind of like afraid, but like a rejoicing thing where I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> it's pretty, you can't, it's just, he speaks to you. Literally, he does. He speaks to your heart. It's almost like a walkie talkie thing going on, right? You're, just, you're reading his word and you know what his will is and you know it, you know, he speaks to you. And, and it just, it's, it's, it's loud. It's audible in that sense. But uh, it's awesome. Now, we have a personal relationship, and that's kind of what's happening here. He's starting to have that personal interaction with the Lord. And, and personally, that's what God wants from us as well, right? We don't, he doesn't want us to play church all the time, be religious people. Um, but true change, obviously, only comes from within us. We can change our outward, but it's the inward until God changes the inward then everything else, right, outward, starts to take effect, and it, it just ripples from there. But it has to take, it has to be done in your heart, right? You have, there has to be a surrendering, and then God will come in and take action, in, in a sense. So, um, so let's look at the vows, and this is the last part. Here's the vows of Jacob, and there's really just two of them, so if you guys want to add anything, please do, so that, um, it goes by really quick. So the first is in verse 18 through 21. Look at verse 18. It says, Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. Excuse me. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. And then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Notice the first vow he's making right here. If the Lord does these, then there's the ifs and the thens, right? So since God is with him and he's guiding and he's providing for him in that sense, he then in turn is going to choose to allow the Lord to be the Lord over his life, right? The God of his life. And when we realize 
all that the Lord has done for us, how should our response be unto the Lord? Right? How should we respond? What should we give unto the Lord once we realize that all the things He's done? But how can we realize all the things He's done unless we stop to actually look at His Word and spend time in His Word, not distracted time, but alone and personal time, devotional time, prayer quality time. And those are good times. So notice when we talk about God, by the way, we're talking about salvation, we're talking about eternal life, right? When we talk about the Lord... But, or, or I'm sorry about God, when we talk about the Lord, we're, we're talking about Him being master, being ruler, right, over our lives. One who is in charge of us, thus we're submitting to Him, right? We're serving Him, we're, we're giving onto the Lord, right? Everything about us, worship and adoration, and, you know? So, let's look at the second vow. Look at, look at the last verse, in verse 22. And, and this stone which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth, or a tithe, to you. Now, the word tenth is the word tithe. Or the word tithe, then you're, there's a bunch of different translations. Some just say tithe, some say a tenth. It's a tenth. That's what it means, it's talking about. Um, in fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 12, for as... Woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Notice, it all belongs to the Lord. So who are we to think that, oh no, this is my God, I'm only going to give you this little part. So really, you own this much. And God's all, ah, you're really, really? Do you really think you could give God 10%? Oh, thanks, thanks a lot, right? So, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Catch that. You're not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So even our lives, not only our money and the things that we own, even our own bodies belong to the Lord. They're not ours. Right? The money we have, it's not ours. Who are we to say, oh, I'm the Grinch, right? Like, oh, I can buy me all, oh, whatever I want. No, this body's mine. No, it's the Lord's, right? He's your creator. You didn't create yourself, okay? Amen? Yeah. You know, no sociologists, Scientologists, <laughs> weird, more, whatever you're called. All right, so remember, it's not about how much we give. But basically, how we give it, right? It's not about the uh, quantity, but the quality, basically, of our hearts giving on to the Lord. Whenever we give on to the Lord, um, so even if it's tithe, you know, we have the little box thing and just there for you and the Lord, right? And really, it's a heart matter. We should make the box a heart, right? As a reminder, <laughs> give from your heart and then with the smiley face, right? <laughs> give, give like Joel Osteen gives, right? Yeah, I'd be a happy guy. But, but it's not about that, right? So 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, right? And that's the, man, it's a delight, Lord, to give back, because this is all yours. So when you recognize that God owns the bank, and he put you in charge of that bank, and God says, hey, I need this much money or whatever it is, you're like, it's not even mine. I'm just managing it, right? Go, of course it's yours. Lord, take it, please, right? Uh, I want you to have it because it's already his. So it's amazing that people don't realize that. And, and they, they need to, like, you know, go through circles on the teachings all the time. And then finally it's like, click. Wow, it's all the Lord. So of course I'll give you whatever, right? And it's a blessing to do it. And so God doesn't care about money, right? He doesn't he care any less. And, and uh, we can care. Right? But that's our flesh. Are we really trusting the Lord at that point? Right? So it's all about the heart matter, right? Before you and the Lord. So I'll just, I don't know. Do you guys want to add anything else? I, uh, I've been kind of sinking in my head. We were doing a study last week over, like, the different terms for Lord and God. And it's really been challenging me. Like, now reading the Old Testament stuff, mm -hmm. seeing the personal words. And when you read 21... I kind of wanted to just understand the, the aspect of what Jacob's gone through here. And the word, uh, it, he says, the Lord, then shall the Lord be my God. The word, uh, then shall the Lord is Jehovah, mm -hmm. which means existing one and true God, right? Yeah. And 
And then it says, the Lord be my God, which is Elohim, which is personal and plural. Mm -hmm. So not only is it saying that, that the existing one, the true God, will be my personal God, so he's recognizing the promises of God and saying not only do I submit because he's the one true God, but now he's my personal God and we have a relationship mm -hmm. and he's triune. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I'm just like, wow, that's crazy, dude. Yeah. So is he really the Lord over our lives as far as our leadership goes, you know, over the, the church? Is the church saying, hey, it, the, the Lord's our God? It, what about our marriage? Is he the Lord over our marriage? Is he the Lord over our families? Is he the Lord over our... Right? And it goes on from there. And, and not only personally, because that's what you're saying too, right? Like, yes, he's our Lord, but in every aspect of that, is he really the Lord over, you know, surrounding over everything? And do we, do we make him the Lord over those areas? Because there's a lot of opportunities that God gives us to test us whether we recognize that he's in charge of our lives in those areas, right? Where, and I, I remember a uh, mission trip, right? Boom, I'm on a mission trip, I'm on the other side of the world, and I'm, I'm just, my heart's all like, Jesus, right? I want to give the gospel, but I want, I, I'm prepared to just, I want to, I want to give my life away to these people, whoever, you know, receives the gospel, I want to disciple them, and just walking through the Word. So I'm pumped, man. I'm prepared. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm coming in with a plan. And, I, and you know, I'm giving up you know, the heart, my heart to the Lord. And, but then I'm watching the whole team that I'm with. And they all have money, right? I have like only a little bit of money. And they're all buying like souvenirs and stuff. And I got distracted, honestly. And, and I went to the Lord that night too. And I was like, Lord, nothing. That's the, no, never mind, right? But the Lord knows your heart. He heard, he heard this much, and only like that much came out. But it was interesting because that morning, I, I go to the bank, and I give him my money to transfer it into the euros or whatever it was, and they gave me like, I think it was like five times more than they were supposed to give me. And I remember just being like filling in my pocket of all the like it was a thick stack like that, and I was like, uh, pretty sure I didn't have that much. <laughs> so I count it all in my bed when I get to the place, and it was way more than, right? Like, way too much, right? I knew what the, the transfer rate was and all that, and I did the calculations, and, uh, but that's exactly, it was, it was really a test, right? I know it was obviously something from the enemy, but it was obviously above the enemy, and the Lord's looking at my own heart and saying, hey, Josh, are you going to trust me? Or, uh, here's, here's what your heart's desire was. Are you going to choose to go in the flesh and live it up? Or, or right away I knew it. I was like, wait a minute. Where am I right now? A missions field. Talk about a distraction, right? The enemy loves to bless you like crazy. He'll give you what you want, literally. But are you willing to choose God and say, Lord, you're, you're, you're the Lord of my life. I'm going to choose you instead of this money, right? I don't know. What was I going to buy with that, right? Like, I could care less. But, so I did. I took it back. And it, like, felt good. But it was really a testing of my own heart, which is crazy, too. It ended up being in the newspaper there in uh, Ireland that, because it was a certain amount, I forget now, but they, they were like, wow, the, the American missions trip, whatever. And so everybody in the city, and I think it was in Waterford, they all knew who we were at that point. So, like, word got out. So really, if it was the enemy that chose for evil... It ended up being for good because they're like, "Oh, you guys are the Americans!" Hey, and it was it was like a quick like good testimony. yes, good 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 standing with them. So, praise God that He's able to do that. But it happens in every area of our lives, right? Not just money, um, but every area, right? Like He wants to be the Lord of our lives. Your emotions, right? Your choices, your feelings, your everything. Is is He in charge, or are you in charge? It's just a good little question to consider. Don't answer. <laughs> Please. <laughs> anything, anything else you guys want? Yeah, there's, there's two sides when you think about Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear. And I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. What's well, interesting, because for Jacob, uh, and I always make this uh, 
maybe somewhat of an interesting point, is that from him obviously the 12 tribes. So that's when really Israel, the Israelites come about. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call Isaac an Israelite or Jewish because they're not descending from Jacob, right. you know. And it's from Jacob you get the 12 tribes. What's interesting though is that this same thing is the same thing that Jesus reassures them, which if they, you know, were thinking of what, back to Jacob, what does he tell them? Do not worry and saying, what will we eat? Or what mm. will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? Yeah. Right? Both of those promises. And of course, in John chapter 4, he tells them, you know, that he will go prepare a place for them with the Father. You know, that whole thing, they'll prepare a mansion for you. Right. So that for you, that same thing. And it's interesting, but he says, um, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know? And so it's kind of an interesting tie-in, because they would definitely look at Jacob as one of the greats of the faith, and what does Jesus tell them? If you're seeking first him, <laughs> right. look what's going to be added to you. Right. And this was already added to them, you know, a lot of times throughout the scripture, that would use Jacob in the form of a corporate solidarity to represent everybody, when obviously, you know, Jacob's already passed, but later on we're reading Jacob, <coughs> you know, or Israel. Right. So. right? That's cool. I like it. I when I read this verse twenty and twenty one, it, it it seems to me like it says then Jacob made a vow saying if God will be with me, if He will keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then He shall be my God. Right. In other words, if He comes with me as I go in this path instead of trusting him no matter where God leads him. Yeah. See? He's saying if God does all these really cool good things for me, <laughs> then he'll be my God. Almost a conditional Yeah. yeah. Conditional. Well you Wait, see he's not yeah. he's that doesn't sound like a good thing to me. Right. Well remember he just had in the context, he just had this dream and according to verse 15, God said it straight out. Hey, I, I will behold, I am with you. Right now, basically, I'll keep you wherever you go. In other words, I'm going to hold you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to be there for you. And, and, and so in that sense, when you read on, it's almost like Jacob's like, wow, if God is with me, if that's the case, the wording there, Right? If this, because this is true, because God said it, and because now I've actually heard from God myself, then I will, right? So now he's declaring, because of this dream that he had, like, you know, the revealing of God in his life, that he's already in his life, then now I'm going to, and, and that's really the, 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 the meaning here, the text. And so obviously you see, it's not a, if he does those things in the future, because he's already making the declaration by anointing the, well, I wouldn't say anointing, but pouring the oil right on the rock. And he's already doing the works, the actions of the ifs, right? So he already declared that God is already with him, according to the dream. So by obviously doing these things, he sets up the pillar, right? So, and then he gives unto the Lord at that point. So how did he give to the Lord, right? So he gave him a tenth. Um, it must have been a short pillar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said he took the rock and, and poured oil on it. It was like this thing. Yeah, he put a little thing. <laughs> yeah, a little, little salt and pepper, you know. And, you know. Actually, in the original, it's not there. I was going <clears> to <throat> say, that's not a... What? It says, though, he said... What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, I was going to say, because at first, that's totally how I read it, too. Like, if you'll do these things for me, God, yeah, then I'll serve you. But, but given the context, yeah. you know, it is like, hey, if you're going to do all these things, God, like, how can I not, how mm -hmm. can you not be my God? How, yeah. can, how can I not let you 
you know, right. lord over me. Because you are, right. then... Because like you said, you know, here we have, you know, we have God introducing himself, and the picture that he's giving him is of a God of authority with the angels descending and ascending, you know, like him sending him out and mm -hmm. calling him back in. He's showing, you know, Lord like just a picture, <laughs> yeah, to In Jacob general. that he has authority over everything. And then for him to say, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to give you this land, I will go with you, I will provide for you, and this and that. It is like, it, it is like, you know, given that context, Jacob being like, well, how can I say no to you? Right. Like, what, am I supposed to just keep trucking on this dirt road, like, with my, right. you know, the little bit of, you know, like, bread that I've got left yeah. in my sack and say, no thanks, I'm okay. Yep. You know, it's like, hey, if you're going to do this, then you'll be my God. Right. I, I thought the same thing as I think we all did, right, when we first read through here. And then you keep reading through it, then you then the context sinks in, right? Mm -hmm. And it really just yeah. explains itself. Once we brought back the, you know, once we bring it back into context, then you're like, oh yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Right. <laughs> and the fact that God didn't smush him. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. Up. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those dreams where you're like getting about to get shot and you wake up. Whoa! <laughs> I just got sludged. It definitely seems like it would, it would hint almost a little bit because of the rock and the oil. Like, yeah, Jesus being the rock and the spirit. He did everything in the spirit and his earth and his ministry. Holy Spirit. When Israel himself. You know, when he's back amongst his people, and he's their God, mm -hmm. you know, and things are starting to get on track. Yeah. You yeah. know? That's neat. Think of Jesus himself <coughs> on this rock. That was set my set up my church, right? Mm -hmm. Chief cornerstone, so there's that imagery of the rock. Let's pray. Um, Father, thank you so much, Lord. You are... A rock that nobody can break, Lord, that you are in control of this world and there's nothing that no man can plan or conjure up, Lord, to change what you've already uh, begun here in this world. And you've allowed us to be a part of what is good in your plan and what is just pleasing onto your sight, Lord, and uh, you're able to, to just rejoice over us, Lord. It's just amazing and just, I'm astonished, Lord. And that were anything in your sight because of you, Lord. I thank you that your blood was shed upon that cross for our sins. That when we gave our lives to you, Lord, we were forgiven truly. And now we can experience that peace and that rest in our lives. And so I just thank you that we have these examples like Jacob, Lord, in our lives. Uh, to Who just choose, Lord, after making mistakes in our lives and just doing so many wrong things. Um, there's still opportunity to be obedient to you, Lord, to just take heed uh, to your grace, Lord, in our lives, because uh, we humble ourselves, and so just thank you so much, Lord, that you're able to do a, a mighty work, and most of the time in, the, in ways we can't even see, and just thank you so much as well for the angels, Lord, to be an example to us how we should be ministers, Lord, of one another, and we should... Uh, come before your throne constantly, Lord, and report to you, being obedient in that way, and, and just constantly uh, just doing what you called us to do without any arguing, without any, uh, any word back on to you, Father, but amen. And so just thank you so much, Lord, that you're willing to do that work in our lives. And we just love you. In Jesus' name, amen.